the, uh, the, the building is lively, which is good. Don't race to sit down. You know, just kind of get seated down, sit it down. What's, what's proper? I'm still struggling over the BB, the big breath. Oh, really? Yeah, that would really mess me up. Evidently, Pete's really ready, so I'm going to pray. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's actually a positive, right? It'd be different if I said, Pete, please, you're up. <laughs> We're thankful for both of our Sunday school teachers. They do such a fantastic job. We're thankful for their carefulness in the scriptures and, um, a funny story was, I'll tell this because I already mentioned it to Dwayne, is a fellow called me that I know and he says, hey, he goes, I was watching live stream and I just assumed he meant here. And he says, I got a lot of questions on what that guy taught in Sunday school. He said, it just didn't seem right. And I'm thinking, man, that was Dwayne. I was out here. You know, I, mean, I said, that just doesn't make sense to me. He goes, yeah, you got to watch live stream. He goes, people were asking questions and they, and they kept saying, it doesn't make sense. And you know, and I'm thinking, oh my goodness. And I go, well, what was the subject on? He says, what was on the judgment seat of Christ? And I'm thinking, well, He's not even teaching on the judgment seat of Christ. In the passage he's at, what could that be? So I get, on, I get online and I, I start watching it. I maybe watch the first 15 minutes of it. And that guy called me and said, have you watched it yet? And I said, well, I just started right now. And I said, uh, Dwayne's doing a, doing a great job right now in the introduction and everything. He goes, who's Dwayne? <laughs> and I said, the guy that you told me you were live streaming. He goes, no, not him, this guy. <laughs> it's a lot. I got it. So, so I'm worried for three days, you know, what's going on. We, we save the heresy for when you're gone. Oh, well, I watch it then, too. <laughs> I watched you uh, Sunday morning live. All right. Well, uh, we'll turn it over to Pete, and let's open up with a word of prayer. I just wanted to also say if you get a chance to look at the um, uh, sign back there, not the sign, the um, map. We're down to about four streets. We're down to about four streets, and we'll have every, every home reached with a piece of literature in the town of, um, of Hampshire. We're not, we're not quite there, but we're, we're getting close. We'll finish up this year, which is um, really a, tribu a tribute to uh, God's grace and a lot of help. And uh, certainly um, those MBT guys were a big help. Uh, certain people that come every Saturday are a big help, and then also... Um, Andrew Ramirez uh, hit a lot of streets as well, so we're thankful for those of you that were able to get out. Father, thank you now as we turn our eyes, our focus, our heart, our life, our very breath, our very existence is attributed to the grace of you to send your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us. So no matter what anybody says that's unsaved or thinks we're off our rockers, we know that the internal witness of you is in us and we know that and that cannot be taken away and so we cannot be convinced any other way we know that we know that we know that we know that we know you and father thank you for that convincing that we have uh, through these earthly witnesses as well now bless and encourage us as we uh, look into your word not only in Sunday school but in the main service bless and encourage us Thank you for allowing um, others to come and help us, as well as the church itself, to reach the doors of Hampshire. Father, would you please uh, let people know and remind them through the literature we pass that there is a God in heaven that is the answer to all their situations. So, Father, thank you for that. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right. I'll wait until he closes the door behind him before I start talking about him. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> well, good morning. So, <clears throat> an American businessman was at the pier of a small coastal Mexican village when a small boat with just one fisherman docked. Inside the small boat were several large yellowfin tuna. The American complimented the fisherman on the quality of his fish and asked how long did it take to catch them. The fisherman replied that it only took a little while. The American then asked, well, why didn't you stay out longer and catch more fish? The fisherman said he had enough to support his family's immediate needs. The American then asked, but what do you do with the rest of your time? 
The fisherman said, I sleep late, fish a little, play with my children, take a siesta with my wife, Maria, stroll into the village each evening where I eat a simple dinner and play guitar with my amigos. I have a full and busy life, senor. The American scoffed, I'm a Horton MBA. I can help you succeed beyond your wildest dreams if you're ready to work for it. You should spend more time fishing and with the profits, buy a bigger boat. With the profits from the bigger boat, you could buy several boats. Eventually, you'd have a fleet of fishing boats. Then, instead of selling your catch to a middleman, you'd sell directly to the processor and eventually open your own cannery. At that point, you'd control the product, processing, and distribution. You'd need to leave the small, this small coastal fishing village and move to Mexico City, then LA, and eventually New York City, where you'd run your expanding enterprise. The fisherman asked, but how long will all this take? The American replied, eh, 15, 20 years, but then what? The American laughed and said, ha, that's the best part. When the time is right, you announce an IPO and sell your company's stock to the public and become very rich. You would make millions. Millions? Then what? The American said, well, then you retire, move to a small coastal fishing village where you'd sleep late, fish a little, play with your grandkids, take a siesta with your wife, and stroll to the village in the evenings where you could eat a simple dinner and play your guitar with your friends. <clears throat> so, I'll get back to that. Today's lesson is entitled, Be Ready, Be Strong in Your Answer. Right out of the gate, Sexton, the author of our study guide, mentions how often people will say that they are ready to die, they have all their affairs in order. That brought kind of a twinkle to my eye because just last week, Daniel and I spent some time together and he asked me to share some lessons that I've learned in my life. Now, I love getting those kinds of open-ended questions because they force you to think. And as my brain gets older, it needs all the exercise I can give it. Well, I told Daniel about a Sunday school lesson I had taught to the teens on New Year's Day many years ago. That year, New Year's Day was a Sunday. The lesson was about living a life with no regrets and started out with a little arithmetic. I heard those groans. I, I told the class how old I was in days. I recalculated that for this morning, and I'm happy to say that as of today, I am 23,809 days old. Now, that's not a round number, but it's still a pretty big one. And in case you're wondering, and I know you're not, on, on January 5th, 2026, I'll be 25,000 days old. Put that on your calendar. I'm sure Katie will want to make a cake with lots of candles. <laughs> Just to be safe, I'm going to reserve the, the cafeteria, the fire department across the street. Anyway, <clears throat> my point to the class back then was that when you break your life down into smaller, discrete pieces like days instead of years, you can begin to appreciate the potential that awaits you every day. I've had 23,809 opportunities to fulfill that potential. Now, granted, when I was wearing diapers, my potential was pretty constrained, but nonetheless. Then I took the exercise even a little further. If we assume that throughout your life, your heart beats an average of once per second, over my 23,809 days, my heart has beat 2,057,097,660 times. Now, besides asking the teens to marvel at the miracle that is the human body God created, I wanted them to understand that God doesn't promise any of us another day, let alone another moment. Every heartbeat is a moment that will never be repeated. Every moment excluding the ones when we're asleep or unconscious, is an opportunity to live for God or not. Sexton rightly turns the discussion then back to the other side of the coin. Instead of being ready to die, we should be ready to live for Christ. 
So I think that's enough of an introduction, and I better get praying here because I know I'm going to need it today. <clears throat> Father, thank you so much for the great privilege you give us to be able to read and study your word. Thank you, Lord, for this church and the people who faithfully attend it and support it. Thank you, Lord, for our pastors who give so much to us in this church and this community and who uh, are a shining example to us of how we should be uh, living for you. I pray now, Lord, that you'll uh, give me strength and uh, have, the, have me speak the right words and have the, the lessons that uh, you want me to teach imparted properly and that uh, as a result we'll understand a little bit more about what it means to strengthen the brethren. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. <clears throat> Our key verses for this morning are 1 Peter 3, uh, verses 13 through 17. 1 Peter 3, 13 through 17. <clears throat> Starting at verse 13, And who is he that will harm you, if ye be followers of that which is good? But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better, if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. So in verse 13, Peter starts out by asking, who can harm us if we're followers of that which is good? That sounds about right. If we're saved and a child of God, God is on our side. His Holy Spirit lives within us. But sometimes we can get an even better understanding of God's word if we dig a little deeper. So I did what most people would do. I look up a concordance. The Greek word for the word followers here, and I'm going to butcher this, I know, is mamites, which is imitator. Now that evokes a stronger image than the word follower. But how does one imitate a thing which is good? Are we supposed to, you know, pose about something? You know, how do you imitate a thing that is good? So, ah, let's see what the Greek can tell us. The Greek word here is agathos which is the same word Jesus uses in Matthew 19, 17. And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is, God. So Peter here is using another name for God, the good one, as opposed to the other name for Satan, the wicked one. As uh, you know, Jesus mentioned during the parable of the seeds, then cometh the wicked one. <clears throat> but back to 1 Peter 3, 13. You have to remember what was happening when Peter wrote his epistle. At best, back then, Christians were being shunned and ostracized. At worst, they were being martyred. He's not saying that no physical harm will come, uh, will, will befall Christians then or now. Peter's telling us that if we are imitators of God, no real harm can come to our souls. Paul says pretty much the same thing in Romans 8.31. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? These verses should be of great comfort to us, especially in the worst of times, because no matter what befalls us on earth, if you're saved, when you die, you will wake up in heaven. It sounds so simple, doesn't it? Why worry about death? when it means going to heaven. I once heard a, an evangelist recall his experience of being robbed at gunpoint. When the robber pulled out his gun, the evangelist just laughed. The mugger was confused and asked why he was laughing. The evangelist said, you're really going to threaten me with heaven? So I don't know if the evangelist was, was exaggerating a bit or not, but it's a truth we should always remember. While we should all try to enjoy God's gift of life for as long as he wills it, when we eventually face death, we should be so confident in our destiny that it brings a smile to our face. That would be a great place to simply end this lesson, wouldn't it? But I've got a few more pages, so 
I'll press on here. So, Peter continues his thought now in verse 14. But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. I don't think any sane person would argue that we live in troubling times. Evil abounds. Sometimes it feels like we're surrounded by it. Now, I don't think I've ever seen a headline that shouted, Peace breaks out across the world! Or even, Man rescues kitten from tree. You don't see those headlines. We're not, we're not inundated with good news. Nobody shouts it from the rooftop. On the contrary, if you watch the news or read those news websites, you're inundated with war, and death, and crime. It seems that every day mankind discovers some new unspeakable evil. And no matter how much we try to separate ourselves from the world, sometimes the world comes knocking on our door and we become victims of that evil. Thankfully, it's usually not some horrible crime or violence, but we can be wronged in so many ways, and often we're targeted because of who and, and what we are. Peter encourages us to understand that if we suffer because we have Christ's righteousness imputed on us, we should be happy that we have been deemed worthy to suffer in some small way like Jesus did. We shouldn't be afraid, nor should we worry. Paul makes the same point in his second letter to Timothy, starting in chapter 1, verse 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and of sound mind. Now, as I was studying this, one of the commentaries made a very interesting observation. Again, remember, during the first century, many Christians were saved Jews. And the only scripture they had was what we now call the Old Testament. Paul is perhaps making an allusion, a reference here, to when God gave Moses the law on Mount Sinai. When God gave the law, it was so spectacularly majestic that it invoked fear in all the Israelites. Even Moses trembled. That was God's intention. The law was given in a spirit of fear. It was a set of commandments, not suggestions, from an almighty God. Now contrast that to the gospel. The gospel was, uh, was ushered in in a much, much gentler manner. Everything was placed on a level with the human intellect. We, we can understand it. It was within the, the reach of every human spirit. No one can obey all the law all the time, but everyone can obtain salvation. Nothing about the gospel is terrifying. Nothing is foreboding. It's an invitation. The very genius of the gospel is its spirit of power over sin, of love, and the clarity of a sound mind that it brings. So in the next verse to Timothy, Paul says in 2 Timothy 1, verse 8, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Again, we need to remember the time when Paul wrote this. Only criminals were crucified. And the punishment was not just incredibly painful, but it was humiliating. Non-believers would scoff at the idea of following the teachings of someone who was crucified and would ridicule and demean Christians because in their eyes, Christ's testimony was not what he said or did, but how he died. Paul, though, is telling Timothy to remember the true power of Christ's testimony. He said much the same thing in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also the Greek. Paul finishes Timothy 1.8 by telling him how to respond when trouble comes his way. He says not to be ashamed of Christ's testimony, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. 
He tells Timothy to embrace those trials, to exult in them, and to rely on God to see them through. Think about it. Now, Paul wasn't Timothy's earthly father, but he probably led him to the Lord. Paul loved Timothy like he was his own son. What parent can wish harm on their child? Paul, who wanted for Timothy nothing but that which was great and honorable and good, tells him to be a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel. Why? Well, because to suffer for Christ and suffer with Christ, it's the highest glory any Christian can attain. What parent wouldn't want the highest glory for their child? When we share the gospel with someone, unlike you know, the Christianity of the first century, think about it, when we share gospel with someone, we, when we mark up some of the streets in Hampshire, we might get cha- chased off a porch, we might have a door slammed in our face, why? We might even have the police called on us for soliciting without a license or something, right? But we probably don't have to worry about being stoned to death. Is it too much for God to ask us to suffer some comparatively minor indignities because we're unashamed to let the world know we're Christians? Well, that wraps up the second of our key verses, so let's return to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Peter tells us here to get and stay close to the Lord, to sanctify our hearts, that is to purify it by letting the Lord direct our ways. We do that by talking to him in prayer and hearing his answer in his word. That way we can provide sound doctrine when someone asks us about our salvation, that hope that is in us. And when we share the truth, we must do it in all humility, absent of pride. We didn't save ourselves, the Lord did. Paul encouraged Timothy to do the same in 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So that's the the first three of our key verses, and we'll cover the last two of those verses a little bit later, so let's now get into Sexton's three points. His three points, let me, surprise, surprise, they're in alliteration again. Readiness involves preparation. Second one is readiness involves a person. And the third one is readiness involves purity. Preparation, person, and purity. So the first one, readiness involves preparation. That seems pretty obvious, doesn't it? But to be ready for something, you have to make preparations ahead of time. Think about someone who runs a sprint in track and field. The starter calls out, runners to your marks, and all the runners approach the starting line. They set their feet in the starting blocks and place their hands just behind the starting line, remaining in a crouch. Next, the starter raises his pistol, yells, set, and the runners raise up, muscles tensed, ready to spring into action. A couple of seconds later, which can seem like an eternity to the participants and the audience, the pistol goes off, and the runner in the first lane collapses. No, 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 the runners leap from their starting blocks, and the race is on. The runners must wait for the gun to go off, or they'll be disqualified. In fact, the rules are even stricter than that. Just this summer, the world record holder in the 400-meter hurdles, an American, was disqualified at the World Track and Field Championship because he started only 0.99 seconds after the gun went off. The rules state that a runner cannot leave the blocks less than one-tenth of a second after the gun. He was disqualified for starting one one one-thousandth of a second too soon. Well, aside from that minor bit of trivia, when you watch a race, the athletes make it seem so effortless. Sure, some of it is raw, God-given talent, but behind that effortlessness, are countless hours of training and years of competition, all in an effort 
to perfect their skills and shave tiny fractions of a second off their personal best times. Their results are, directly, are a direct result of their efforts. If they had just said, you know, tomorrow's gonna be a nice day to run 100 meters, I think I'll go to the track, they probably would have looked a little like me when I was younger. My dad used to describe when I was running the bases, says he'd never seen anyone run so hard and so slow at the same time. <laughs> Someone who makes no effort to prepare for a sprint could hardly expect to win. Someone who never trains for a marathon could hardly expect to even finish. So why do we live, our, why do we live like our Christianity? It's a switch we can just turn on and off at will. Why is it that many times we Christians fail to prepare and yet are surprised when we fail in our Christian walk? To be sure, every journey begins with a single step, and the first step in the Christian walk is to get saved. In John chapter 3, Jesus tells Nicodemus not once but twice that to see heaven, he must be born again. When the Lord of heaven says something more than once, you can be sure it's important. But salvation is only that first step on the Christian walk. There is so much more to do. And to do it well, we must be ready, and that requires preparation. <clears throat> or as my dad used to quote his neighbor from Tennessee, I'm fixing to get ready. <clears throat> Have you ever wondered if the persecution that Christians face in non-Christian cultures ever came to our shores, would you be able to proclaim your faith in Jesus Christ regardless of the consequences? And that time may be closer than we think. Just look north of the border. Canada has been doing some pretty frightening things in the name of social justice, hate speech, and wokeism. So it's, it's a lot closer than you may think. Katie asked herself that same question years ago, and she found a compelling and convicting story about Esther Ahn Kim, a young Korean Christian woman. Her story began in the late 1930s, before the start of World War II. Prior to attacking Pearl Harbor, Japan invaded Korea and parts of China. In fact, the story of the rape of Nanking by the Japanese army is not for the faint of heart. I think it was in 1938, 1939, more than 150,000 Chinese prisoners of war and 50,000 civilians were massacred. Now Esther was a school teacher. She knew the brutality and the inhumanity of the Japanese warlords. She knew their hatred of Christians. She knew of their pagan religion. And she knew that when the Japanese occupied Korea, they would demand that the Koreans bow down to the Japanese shrines. So Esther began to prepare for the inevitable. She first made up her mind that she would not bow down. It's unlike anybody we know in the Old Testament. <clears throat> Knowing this would mean imprisonment. She began to prepare herself for life in a Japanese concentration camp. Though already frail and of delicate constitution, Esther started eating less and less. She ate bruised and rotten produce from the market. She memorized more than a hundred chapters from the Bible. She fasted for long periods of time. When the Japanese invaded and she refused to bow down to their Shinto shrine, as expected, she was imprisoned. She had such strong testimony that she was able to lead many of her fellow prisoners to the Lord. Esther survived six years of torture and deprivation at the hands of the Japanese. After the war, she toured the U.S. and Europe to tell about God's sustaining power. But her message was also clear. When facing life-threatening adversity, prepare not for death, but for life, both physical and spiritually. We can't do that if the only step in our Christian walk is salvation. Esther's survival and the souls that she led to the Lord are proof of what God can do with prepared Christians. The second lesson, the second point here in, in Sexton's is readiness involves a person. I'm getting pretty close to the end here, so I'm going to have to talk, talk slower if I'm going to fill up the time. <clears throat> All our preparations are meaningless if we do them in the flesh. Sure, we might get ready and succeed at something if we plan and prepare sufficiently, but who gets the glory then? Remember, Satan is devious. 
He can help us succeed on our own so often that we convince ourselves we don't need God. Satan just loves setting us up to fail spectacularly because we think we can do anything on our own. I'm reminded of the story, told as a true one, of a gifted Christian soloist who was introduced to sing a special. With the audience in eager anticipation, the singer bounded up the steps to the pulpit with a big smile, his head held high, and waving to the congregation. He proceeded to sing and messed up badly. After he finished, he walked down the steps with his head hung low. When the pastor reached the pulpit, he said, if you'd walked up here like you walked down, you could have walked down like you walked up. So to be ready as a Christian, we must rely on Christ as we prepare. It's not in our own strength. We must walk with Jesus and follow him, imitate him in every way, perhaps especially in humility. As Peter said, we must sanctify him in our hearts by drawing ever closer to him in all aspects of our lives. And as shown in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, <clears throat> Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. We need to write his name on our hearts and then hand him the pen so he can write the story of our lives. <clears throat> the third point is readiness involves purity. Now the last two of our key verses are 1 Peter 3, verses 16 and 17 having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better, if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. There is such wisdom in these two verses. They, it's almost like they belong in Proverbs, isn't it? Peter tells us first to have a good conscience. It's an interesting term. It comes from the Greek term that means moral consciousness. In other words, moral awareness, the ability to recognize good versus evil. You can't do that if you're unconscious. Your spiritual eyes must remain open. You can't turn a blind eye to sin. Even if you have a good conscience, you'll be less likely to commit sin. So when the unbelievers speak evil of you, as evildoers will do, they'll be speaking lies. And when, by your consistency and good conversation in Christ, the lies will eventually be revealed, the evildoers will be shamed and you will be exonerated. Now, there's no guarantee that that will happen, but it won't happen in the contrary. If it's going to happen, you must have a good conscience, a clear conscience, and live a, a good life. Now, verse 17 is a real gem, isn't it? If God wills it, it's better for us to suffer for doing well than to suffer for evil. Fortunately, that saying, no good deed goes unpunished, isn't always true. Just sometimes it seems like it. <laughs> We've talked a lot about Timothy in this lesson, but Paul's writings so perfectly support Peter's points. In 1 Timothy 4.12, Paul says, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Paul charges Timothy to be an example to the believers. He lists six characteristics that will give Timothy the credibility he needs. And I think Paul lists them in ascending order of importance. The last, and I think the most important one, is purity. I know I quote my dad often, but it's my way of keeping his memory alive. I, I don't think it was an original saying of his, but he would remind me regularly, and I needed it, that it takes a lifetime to build a good reputation, but only a moment to destroy it. We need to steadfastly guard our purity if we're to have any effectiveness as a Christian. 
And like every other aspect of our lives, we can't do that on our own. We need the Lord. So I'll wrap up this lesson with three mostly related thoughts. First, that fisherman, he was already succeeding when he met the businessman. The businessman thought he could help the fisherman succeed if he was ready to work. We need to recognize that God can give us everything we need and even much of what we want. But we need to prepare and be ready on his terms, not ours. Second, we must prepare and be ready to live as Christians and treasure every moment that we have. It's a gift, every single one of them. James 4.14, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. Treasure every moment that God gives you. But finally, we must recognize that we're not the only ones getting these precious moments from God. Everyone we know, every stranger we meet, every visitor who comes to Faithway is an eternal soul living in a mortal body. Every second of every day, souls are being transported to their eternal destinies. Time's a wasting. Let's prepare so we can, as Peter says in verse 15, be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And there's no page 14, so I'm done. Thanks, folks. I have to count to a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. How about that? <laughs>